pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could you call the roll? Aye. Ms. Alvarez? Here. Myra Krupp? Here. Jan Lincoln? Here. Jordan McNabb? Here. Nevada Smith? Here. Collier? Here. Mary Reese? Gail Zumwalt? Here. We do have a quorum. We do. And I believe we have a public comment tonight. Mr. Dino has comment. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the Board of Trustees. My name is Arnie C. Mr. Dino, public advocate. Uh, first things I'd like to touch upon are. I really appreciate the library district doing as much preventive uh, processes as possible. Um, you guys are the example. I go to a lot of governments throughout the state and the county. This is the number one excellent example that you should set for other governments and other community meetings. Um, I'm really impressed with the mass um, diligence by staff, uh, the prevention and the accommodations that have been taking so far. Um, helps a lot to the president of the is it also the county director of administration? So, mass work out in the county health department. I wish it was true to all the other agencies throughout St. Charles County. This light up, I asked you to reach out to the police chief of the city of St. Peter's. My conversation three weeks ago with him was he reached out to the director of public health. He was more mass work as a police officer. But I just want to say to Jason and to the staff and outstanding um, prevention and accommodation. Uh, Limits. Sorry, I think I need to speak a little bit more. Um, the other thing that I'd like to speak about is the ethics. That's uh, 21 slash 08 on your agenda. As you all know, a clean Missouri was uh, passed by voters uh, two years ago for state uh, offices and uh, state elected officials. I'd like to also be part of our library district. And anyone who's involved in any new contracts or any contract negotiations. Just stay clear of any gifts, any tickets, any meals, trips, those type of things. So the uh, uh, code of ethics uh, for public disclosure, I'd like to stiffen it up and make sure that people that we're doing business with and making contracts, that there's no impropriety or no possibility of a conflict of interest. You know, one vendor is selected over another because they gave a gift or a meal or some type of uh, thing of money. Uh, the state law limits it to elected officials to $5. I believe our county has instituted a uh, code of ethics in which they can't receive anything of value or any gifts. I'd like that the same move with the library district. Um, the other thing I wanted to speak about was um, the policy uh, of bylaws for the Board of Trustees. If I read it correctly, I think because of COVID, there were some treasure and some financial issues give signatory uh, authority to somebody to sign during the vote uh, of crisis. So uh, I'm not in opposition to that policy. If I read that correctly, I didn't read that correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, so reports and correspondence, the financial report. Oh, yes, I'm including your packet, um, the second revised version of June. <coughs> um, how this works is the second in August, you'll receive a third and final review um, in September. That version is what the auditors will use to do their um, audit and produce the um, auditor's financial statements. Um, so, this version, uh, the two additional versions, allow us to include appropriately you know, revenues and expenditures that relate to fiscal 20. Um, you see those, um, you know, uh, for one or two months after the end of the year. Hey, hey Julie, can you speak up a oh, bit? Certainly. Okay. Speak into the microphone up here. Oh, sure. Uh, so as far as the revenues, you'll see that we're almost at 100%. Um, we, uh, in June, 
but had almost 200,000 uh, less in services. You're seeing an impact of COVID since mid-March, uh, but we did make it up in other areas with a 100% as far as revenues. Um, expenditures, again, you're seeing the impact of uh, COVID for three and a half months. Uh, we were uh, in a mode of uh, preparing for COVID as well as being cautious and uh, really looking at our expenditures uh, moving into fiscal 21. So, um, the end of 21, the second set that I've included is July. And you'll see uh, to start, since all of our revenues were accrued into fiscal 20, we only have 13,000 minimal revenues for July. Um, yet we're almost at 1.8 in expenditure. So we started the year strong, uh, considering like our COVID situation. Um, and uh, in addition to that, our projects are moving along. Currently, the auditors are in the, uh, well, they're doing interim this week, so in process. Do you have any questions regarding the expenditures for fiscal 20 or 21? Any questions? And then just as a reminder, in September, as far as revenues are concerned, we will be setting the tax rate. So I should be receiving the public tax money. Is there any questions from anybody on the um, Zoom call? Daisy, Gail, I don't have any questions. <clears throat> I don't either. Okay. Thank you. All right, director's report. All right. Um, I highlighted in the written report a number of um, the building projects that we're making progress on um, over um, the past month. So he, uh, has been to Sarah Cliffy. We are on schedule um, to have construction done in November and opened in early, very early 2021. Um, we also, um, after several delays, the building in Portage to Sioux has been removed now um, and the lot has been smoothed over and planted. Uh, let's see, we um, have an expected uh, delivery date now for the bookmobile that you approved the ordering of that last um, last month, and that is in mid-2021. Uh, let's see. So really, we just wanted to take some time and, well, and actually before that, we have, so both the, um, our location at Orchard Farm Elementary School has started up now, um, that started last week, and um, Ben has a temporary pickup location for Catherine Linneman is operational. Um, the one thing that is an alteration at Orchard Farm is that because of COVID, they are not allowing any visitors in the building. So um, they did not want it to be a full location at that point, but they did allow us to offer curbside in return. So um, that was very gracious of them to do that. I did want to speak a little bit about Catherine Linneman. Um, we are, I can say that I think all of us at the library probably share your frustration in that it is we're doesn't seem like we're making a lot of progress. And um, I will say, we, we've gotten some comments. I got an email yesterday about people not seeing any construction work happening, so thinking no work is happening. And, and that is not true. <laughs> there is work happening. Um, what's happening right now is we are working with an engineer. So to kind of go, go back to summarize the situation, in, in mid-May, we had, there was a, a primarily a stormwater backup into the branch that caused significant amount of damage. The, Circulation desk was damaged beyond repair. Most of the flooring or a lot of the flooring. Um, all of the shelving that was sort of built in around in the fireplace room was all um, damaged beyond repair. So as, as a piece of that remediation, the lower two feet of all drywall was removed. And in the process of doing that flood remediation, they discovered that there had been evidence of past and probably ongoing water infiltration outside of this one event. Um, the lower parts of some of the metal studs were rusted. So, I mean, that pointed to a sort of a longstanding issue. There was um, evidence of, um, I'm blanking on the word, hydrostatic. hydrostatic pressure. So water penetrating the foundation from below. And um, so, 
where we are now is that has to be remedied. That has to be diagnosed by an engineer and a remedy um, suggested that we're working with an engineer to do that before we can go back and put everything back together again. So that is where we are. We expect to have something from the engineer within a couple of weeks. Um, so that work is happening in addition to all the sourcing and all the work is, is for all the furniture replacements and that Lori and her team and the building team and, and Julie's team are actively working on that right now. So all that behind the scenes stuff is going on. We should have within a couple of weeks of an actual timeline um, and a better sense that we want to bring it to you kind of all at one package um, for, for the expenditures. So that is where we are with Taffer and Lemon. Um, and switching gears a little bit, I know one thing that came up, you see our summer challenge has now ended. We had a, a very um, healthy completion rate and one of the things that came up at this meeting in the past was the the gorgeous garden posts and auctioning those off. We are doing that now. So we are in the midst of, of collecting all those posts and we're putting together um, a means by which to auction them off and use them to raise money. And speaking of money, I also wanted to highlight um, a number of grant opportunities that we have either been awarded or are have applied for. I think I mentioned at one meeting in the past, the CARES funding in the amount of $50,000 that we were awarded to install um, remote pickup lockers at the Corporate Parkway and Kisker Road branches. So this promotes contactless service delivery. We have also now applied for a grant, a part of the COVID relief fund uh, in the amount of $120,000. And this one is focused specifically on broadband and um, helping telehealth and higher education. So that, um, we did apply for that. We, I mean, fingers crossed, anticipate um, being awarded that grant. And what we would do is we would increase the um, Wi-Fi speed throughout the district and then also put together some um, device and hotspot kits that can be used for um, telehealth and higher education. And we would work with some of our nonprofit partners that have clientele um, that would need those. And then also the foundation uh, just received uh, just short of $10,000 from the Dana Brown Charitable Trust for um, ready to read literacy kits. So um, I think we, we recognize that we have to find new sources of revenue. So who goes to the staff for, um, for doing that? And then lastly, I just wanted to remind you that election of officers takes place at the next meeting and the new term for officers starts in October. Oh. All right, the statistical report. Okay, uh, well, it's a pretty sad looking gate count graph there when you see that big drop off, but that is to be expected um, for the first month of fiscal year 21 when we are open short hours and we're not offering any in person programming and um, use of e media continues to increase. So. Um, to that last point, you do see that there is um, over an 11.5% increase in our e-media usage. I did just want to touch briefly on the circulation, and this is actually less of a good thing. Um, it shows about a 25% decrease, but it's probably greater than that because when, um, when we closed, we extended due dates and everything was due back in July. So anything that was not old and was eligible probably also then auto renewed in July. So you're seeing a lot of July activity um, there as well. But um, that is to be expected given the circumstances. Any questions about the statistical report? I just will go back a second. Mm -hmm. I had a question about Catherine Lindeman. Mm -hmm. So it's it's completely closed right now. It is. So uh, we are doing, um, I guess, are we still doing lunch at the library? The library. We just finished the library. And then the, so we are offering at the Shen across the street. That's where we're doing curbside um, pickup. That was my question. How are we providing services for people that's offered the Shen? Yeah. And besides Catherine Lindeman, what's the next closest branch? Uh, McClay is work. Yeah, basically, McClay is the closest. Okay. Um, this is the closest large regional, so we are seeing some patrons here as well. And how are we communicating in terms of 
terms of what the other options are for the after Lindman people if that went out in an email blast or Facebook or all of the above, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Did you raise your hand? hand. I was just gonna say I know that outreach is providing a lot of uh, by mail service or delivery service to people who are able to walk to that branch. Um, so they've set them up for on delivery. So we're doing mail stuff for capital people. That was gonna be my other question. Yep. Okay. Thank you. No, that's okay. Oh, no. Does anybody else have a question about the director's report? I, I failed to uh, inquire. All right. Uh, the respondents. And uh, so that brings us to the consent agenda. We have the minutes from the July 14, 2020 meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from July 14, 2020. And we have a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second it. Two seconds. Are there any modifications or changes or questions about the minutes? Hearing none. All in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. 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 One opposed? The minutes are approved. All right, no old business on new business. We start with 21-05, discontinuation of fines for overdue materials. All right, so this has been a long time coming and we've talked about this at somewhat at length um, at meetings in the past, over the past probably 18 months or so. Um, and so I'll just, I won't kind of read, I'll, I'll just kind of hit the highlights um, and I can certainly answer questions. But first, I want to be very, very clear to distinguish uh, one point of confusion that we see a lot when discussing overdue fines in libraries. And that is the distinction between overdue fines, which are like the 10 cent fine that gets charged when you return something late versus charges for material that's never returned or that's damaged or that's lost. And we are only dealing with the first one here, um, sort of the, what is essentially a punitive fine um, for returning something late and not the reimbursement to the library for things that are damaged or never returned. Those are, those are unchanged and in fact, probably more actively sought to be collected when daily overdue fines are eliminated. So, um, so, you know, as we've talked about in the past, um, the, the, the idea of a, a nominal fine um, that's collected daily for items that are returned overdue has kind of just been ingrained in, in the whole library culture for decades and decades and decades and decades. Um, with that said, there are libraries, some in Missouri, some large ones in Missouri that have never had the practice of, of instituting fines. Um, but the idea was that that was incentive for people to return things on time. And um, perhaps it was, I, I will say though, like it certainly has not kept up with inflation because they still today remain 10 cents a day, which um, for most people, 10 cents a day is not incentive to bring something back. And that has been borne out by all of the research um, from it, well, anecdotal evidence from libraries that have moved away from fines have seen no difference in, in rates of return, but also, you know, scholarly research has happened um, where this has really been, been studied. And, you know, when it's been say why things are returned late or why things are returned on time, fines never enter into a factor. It's because I couldn't make it or I forgot or, or all sorts of things that the 10 cents a day don't really, um, don't really affect. And for most of us, that 10 cent a day is not, if I can't make it to the library to bring something back, it's not the thing that's going to say, well, I guess I have to though because of that dime. Uh, however, the only people that it does provide that incentive for are the people that need the library the most and can least afford to pay it. Um, so that includes, well, first of all, people without easy transportation, but 
children, elderly, um, people with lower income. So what we find is it, it disproportionately affects the people that most need to use the library. And it doesn't provide any incentive for, for everyone else to really do what it's supposed to do. Um, and I think that that's actually kind of borne out in, in a snapshot that we took at one point where about 50,000 of our customers, our active card holders had fines, uh, which is about 14%. They had outstanding fines on their card. 52% of those were inactive. So those are people that were not using the library. That's over half. Um, I don't know how much that directly relates to having those fines on the card, but um, it, it probably plays some, some role. But when you look at the age groups that have the highest percentage of fines, the highest, the, the, the top age group is 13 to 17, teenagers, shockingly, 38% of teenagers have fines up on their card. The next one is 18 to 25 year olds, 35% of them have fines on their card. The next one are children, zero to 12, 33% of them had fines on their card that are outstanding and unpaid. So, um, you know, we're seeing these groups that we, we really want to target with library service, we're putting up a barrier to that service. Um, so just thinking back to when we implemented Polaris, it's just a lot of things that all kind of come together here. Uh, if you remember, we had a homegrown system and we did not ever purge cardholders from our system, which is like, unheard of. Um, so we had every record, every cardholder back to the early 90s in our system. That, that's never done. So when we implemented Polaris, we did the standard and we purged out anyone who had been inactive for three years, which is typical. Um, in doing that, about $2 million of money that was owed went along with those people. Um, but again, those are all people that weren't using the library, so we were never going to see a penny of that. Um, and of that $2 million, mo well, most of it was for lost items. Um, just under 990000 were for overdue fines. Again, those are things that, you know, they hadn't used the library in three years, so we were likely never going to see that. So since we implemented Polaris, there has been about $60,000 worth of fines accrued that added to the existing active card holders that didn't get purged. We're, we have about $350,000 worth of overdue fines currently outstanding. Um, if we think of the idea that fines were an incentive to bring the items back, those fines don't get charged until the item comes back. So they've done their job. We have the items back. Um, they're not reimbursing anything. So, I mean, again, it's just a punitive charge. So, um, and it doesn't mean we would get any of that paid because we don't cut off service until you reach $25 um, on your card. So, um, I know I'm just throwing out a lot of numbers and, and part of this is to answer some questions that we had about this. Um, let's see. Um, we budgeted in fiscal 20 and as I explained that the, sh the shift to electronic materials and overdue automatic renewals has really cut down the amount of revenue from overdue fines. So we collected about $119,000 last year. We did not budget any for this year. And again, that's, that's only the overdue fine. We're still budgeting for material that doesn't get returned. Um, so, and, and you kind of reach a tipping point where it doesn't, it starts to not make sense to spend the money to collect it from the staff perspective at the desk, from the finance department to, to maintain all that cash, from simply the negative interactions that you have around collecting that. Um, so, libraries all across the country and I, I saw announcements almost every day and when we first started talking about this I think I said it, it, it's just sort of a matter of, of when not if that they're sort of just gone industry-wide I think we've definitely now tips where at least I tend to assume a library doesn't charge fines instead of assuming that they do both St. Louis Public and St. Louis County libraries don't charge overdue fines um, it's it really is the standard and I think any library that we're starting from scratch would not it wouldn't even enter into the realm of something that they were, were thinking about um, 
So I mentioned, so how do we get the materials back? And I think that's the biggest misconception that somehow no, there's no longer any expectation for people to return things. And that, that's not the case at all, because as I said, if they don't return something, they are still charged for that thing. They're still billed for that thing. Um, if it reaches more than $25 or $24.99, they can no longer use the library until it's paid. Um, and we're actually would do that earlier. Currently, we do that bill at 60 days late. We would move that up to 28 days late. So we actually, we would, there's almost more accountability, um, not less. And we would also increase the frequency um, that we would notify people of overdue material that they had. We cannot do it to the level that we would have wanted because we're quarantining stuff um, due to COVID. So we can't. We can't notify them quite as early as we would have liked because we're not checking things in for four days once they're returned. Um, but at any rate, they would be billed for the item at, at 28 days overdue at this point. So I'm happy to answer questions. I think I covered a lot of material there. As I said, we did not incorporate any revenue from overdue fines in the fiscal 21 budget. So all well, the action that would be needed from you would be to approve revisions to the five policies listed here on the memo, um, all of which refer to um, late fees in some way. Can I answer any questions? Yes. Why the 28 days? Why the 28 days? Um, is, that, is that just kind of like an industry standard type it's, thing? It's four weeks. Okay. So it's, it, um, in order to have several um, spaced out notices that are electronically produced from Polaris, that it, it could have, it's on a seven day cycle basically. And so that that was built into our system at that particular time. It could have gone longer. Um, we certainly could have extended it, but we felt that, remember, people automatically renew. So once they get that notice, it's either because it's on hold for someone else or they've already had it for 12 weeks. So they or 14 weeks. They, so at that point, if they get it 28 days later, then it's you know 16 weeks that they've had the material. So we felt it was a reasonable and it's very similar to what other places are doing. But that point, if it's not returned within 28 days, they're billed for the item. Yes. And then what happens if after that, it's still not paid? They go to collection? I read something in here about collection. How does that work? So we use a collection service that deals specifically with libraries. Um, it's a collection agency. Um, it, is, it never affects their credit, um, but it is, it's unique. The company's called unique management, I think, um, but they work specifically with libraries to collect fees. So they would then contact them and do whatever they do. Um, Their specific brand of, I mean, it, it, it's not overbearing, I don't think, but um, they take, they have more capacity to pursue and, and try and get that um, paid than, than the library would. Would you say the bigger dollar value of what we have is from late fees or non-return material? Um, I think it was when I looked late fees, um, but it's it's always compressing, I think. Um, and, and again, also, there's so once the item is built, if they still have it, they can bring it back still at that point. It's not like, okay, you kept it out for 28 days, now you have to buy it. And they can still bring it back. So um, I think, that's really the incentive. So suddenly you have a, a $30 charge and you can no longer use the library. So that's what you can the material back. So at any point, if they bring it back, then they're, they're in good standing. Right. Yep. Unless it's damaged. Unless it's damaged. My group reviews all the outstanding charges and if there's a credit on the account monthly. And then if they have bought back, we issue a refund out of my office to the customer. Okay. Sometimes people keep Materials that have been lost on vacation or something. But then they email their card and send it to our seat. And so they bring it back and they can use it. I think it's 90 days. I don't have any more questions. 
Okay. Are there any other questions? I have just, just a couple. So getting back to the numbers, you said 350,000 total, correct? Mm -hmm. But of that, 290,000 is from before Polaris, correct? You correct. said 60,000 current. Yep. So we can we can safely assume that that they're really dealing with 60,000 at this point, because even though they weren't purged from the system, you know, they're old. Yeah. They were old, and it could have just been you know, right at the cutoff or after the cutoff. And okay, that's it. Thank you. It also could be that those assets were small that they don't have control somebody has a 30 cent fine, um, I know that's a lot of 30 cent fine, but they, they wouldn't have to necessarily pay it because they could say, oh, I'll pay it next time. Okay. And then next time, and then the next time, right. and it just rides on their account. Gotcha. Thank you. We need a um, motion for revisions to CO64, C128, C182, C232, and C. 285.5. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the, the item 2105 discontinuation of the fines for overdue materials for policy C064, C128, C192, C232, C285.5. Motion and second. Is there any further questions? Excuse me, he all kinds of weird gestures at me. Ooh, being asked to pick and speak up. Speaking up. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it's the mask. It's far from home. Uh, all right. Are there any further questions? Hearing no questions, uh, all in favor of the of revisions to those policies? Aye. 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 Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay. Are, the, are the board members who are on the uh, phone able to hear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure because I didn't hear it. Okay, uh, 2106 on the bylaws. All right, so this was presented to you last month, but any alterations to the bylaws need to have a 20 day waiting period at minimum. So um, it's coming forward to you for action this month. Um, so all this does is to add the bolded um, piece to the duties of the treasurer, which um, just designates that the treasurer will always fill the slot on the, um, the board of directors of the library foundation that's allocated to a representative from the board of trustees. So the, 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 the board slot or the, the board of directors slot on the foundation isn't new, it's just but what's new is we're just uh, we're saying it will always be the the board treasurer that fills that role. Are there any questions about the change to um, policy A zero four eight? Also, I inadvertently apparently. Opened bolded the part about the audit, but that was existing, so that's not new, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, don't we do an audit? Yeah, we did, that, that was not added. Okay. I just, careless bolding, sorry. Okay. All right, we need a motion for revision of policy A048. I'll move approval of the revision of policy A48 bylaws of the board of trustees as presented. So we have a, a motion from Georgianne, I believe. 
Georgian, the sound was down, so we had trouble hearing you, but I believe it was a motion. Yes, it was. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we need a second. I'll second it. Anybody else a second? Is there any further discussion? All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes and policy zero A048 is amended. 21.07. Approval to terminate the lease at 378 Shadow Pines Drive. Okay, so 378 Shadow Pines Drive is our Discovery Village location. And if you recall back um, summer, last summer, our um, it was a one-year lease at that time did expire and we talked about at that point sunsetting the location we were in the process of buying a property for Clifty when we talked about um, sunsetting a location at that time it is our only facility that's leased from a private owner um, Augusta is leased as well and it's leased from the, the city of Augusta um, and uh, instead we decided to see if we could enter into a month lease with the landlord, which we were able to. So we have been on a month to month lease um, since August 1st, 2019. And we did that in anticipation of being able to continue service until um, we got closer to a point that could view with open. As I mentioned earlier, the construction there will be done in November. And we're looking at a, a very first part of 2021 opening for Clipview. So uh, we do need to give 30 days lease uh, or notice to discontinue the lease at Discovery Village. And um, we would like to sunset or have the last day that Discovery Village is open be October 31st. That gives us, um, we, we budgeted through 2020 to pay rent there. Um, but that would give us a month in order to help transition the staff, to help remove the contents, to do any repairs in order to turn it back over to the landlord. Um, and so we, we do need to have a little bit of a buffer in between Cliff View opening and Discovery Village closing in order to um, transition staff as well. So um, we are looking for your authorization to uh, give notice to terminate the lease at 378 Shadow Pines Drive, effective November 30th. And that would close the library at the close of business on Saturday, the 31st of October. Yes. I'll make a motion to authorize staff to provide notice to terminate the lease at 378 Shadow Pines Drive, effective November 30th. Iris made a motion. Is there a second? Okay. That's a seconded. Is there any additional questions or discussion? All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, 21 dash 083 affirmation of policy G009 on the code of ethics. So, this is just as described in the memo, um, the bylaws state that you will review this policy annually. We do that in August. So, um, here it is for your review. We are not recommending any changes. Discussion of the uh, item 2108 on policy G009.
Hello? <laughs> yes, we are still here. I believe people are making sure they fully understand the policy. Can I ask a question? How long has this particular policy been in place? I believe this was a piece of when we did um, about a year ago when we worked with the attorney to revise all the board policies, and this one doesn't fall in that section, but this was a piece of that. So, <laughs> so it's about a year ago. I'll make a motion that we approve item 21-08 uh, and that we reaffirm policy G009, the Code of Ethics and Public Disclosure. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion passes. And now we have uh, item 2109 revision to policy E368 on the organizational chart. Okay, so if you recall, um, again, probably about a year ago, we did um, kind of reduce the org chart, which at that time was three pages long and, and pulled together all sort of everyone's position, all the various positions in each location to. Um, this one page high level overview of the organization as the, the policy piece. We still maintain the larger, um, the larger full organizational structure internally and we update that as needed. Uh, but there have been a number of changes, um, a couple of them we talked about tonight that necessitate this one being revised. They are um, the removal of the Portage Zoo Branch, the addition of Orchard Farm, and we have moved um, Discovery Village, the responsibility there into a different, under a different regional plan. So um, this will come forward after October 31st, obviously, to remove the Discovery Village branch, but we thought it was important to get those changes captured now, so. Is there a motion to Revised policy E368, the organizational chart. I'll make a motion to approve the revision of policy E368 under the top chart. We have a motion for Myra. Is there a second? I'll second. We're getting a second. Is there any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Here's that is the complete agenda. So we just need a unless there's anything else, we need a motion to adjourn. <coughs> Second. Second. All in favor? 